Robin Simon is a two-time Emmy Award winner and an accomplished writer, producer, director, and editor. She's the producer and director of the documentary film Do No Harm about the healthcare system that drives us physicians to take our lives. We discuss how prevalent physician suicide is and how the real numbers and demographics are so difficult to track. We talk about the differences between paying lip service to change and what changes may actually help. We also talk about how the current coronavirus epidemic will make more apparent how overtaxed and overburdened many physicians already were. There will be an upcoming virtual screening of her film on April 19th and see her website, donoharmfilm.com, for details. Ms. Simon began as a television news reporter in Texas, then joined PBS in Miami, where she hosted and produced documentaries, public affairs programs, and the TV series Florida. She wrote and produced the docuseries Voices of Vision, which focused on the work of nonprofit organizations worldwide. She has produced hundreds of hours of TV for major cable networks, including Discovery, CNBC, HGTV, and currently produces a series on The Reels Channel. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Robin Simon, thanks so much for being on the podcast. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks, Brad. So let's start with the hard numbers. How frequent is it that a physician dies by suicide? The numbers that are used by suicide experts is about 300 to 400 a year. But it's really an underestimate because Many of these suicides are listed as accidental and planned as as accidental overdoses or car accidents. And so the families of the physicians and the hospitals and, you know, the medical community are not eager to say this was a suicide. So we don't really know. It, It could be three or four times that we just... We don't know, but that's what the experts are saying, three to 400. And, and mo- they say that mid-career physicians uh, have the highest rate and women attempt more than men, but male physicians are more successful, if you could use that word, Yeah. at suicide. But mid-career, uh, we see... When there are a lot of factors that come into play, it could be, you know, uh, a malpractice suit that threatens your financial security, uh, your inability to pay off a loan, ruins your reputation, your job could be at risk, and you have a family, and uh, it, it just, you know, leads physicians to make what they feel is a logical choice, a logical solution to the problems. Yeah, that actually doesn't and, and surprise me that it's, it, it, it doesn't surprise me that it's an underestimate because as physicians, right, we also recognize that if you die by suicide, your family can't collect your life insurance. And so if you are going right. to do it, you do it in such a way that it does not appear to be a suicide so that they are able to collect. I can see that being a very calculating thing for, you know, a physician, just the way that's, That's the way we think. We're very pragmatic. Yes. So where does that put us compared to other professions? Well, you know, near the top, if not the top, when I was working on the film editing, which was about a year and a half ago, because we've been on the film tour for about a year and a half, physicians had the highest rate of suicide among all professions and uh, almost twice the rate of the general population. Uh, so it, it fluctuates, you know, from year to year. And because we don't really know the true numbers because of the stigma of suicide and mental health in general, we don't really know, but let's just say it's We're towards high. the top, if not at the top. That's interesting. Yeah. I do. I do not. When I was a, a medical student, when I was applying to medical school, I do not remember that being on the brochure. I, re, I, you know, they put those short, they put there. those they put those short white coats on us and say, welcome to the club. And something that they neglect to tell us 
is that, you know, here's this short white coat. Every patient you see from now on could be something, a diagnosis that you could miss and get wrong that ruins your life and uh, could be something that haunts you for the rest of your life and, and affects them for the rest of their life. And by the way, we have one of the highest, if not the highest suicide rate of all professions. Here's your white coat, right? That's, yeah. I do not yeah. remember that being something that no. was discussed in medical school. That being said, it has been a while. Mm-hmm. Since I since I graduated, so you know I know the the schools have evolved, um, and they are including more things. Oh, they're still that wasn't they're still not saying that. No, that's still not part of the uh, tech talk. Yeah, for new students. Yeah, because another big issue is statistics. You know, we've been trying to find out statistics on the rates of depression and anxiety among medical students. You know, we know that when they go into medical school, they're normal or above normal when it comes to mental health. And within a year, they have a 25% increase in severe depression and anxiety. So um, medical schools don't want to do these anonymous surveys because if they have to show their statistics and other schools don't, would it leave them at a competitive disadvantage? So in the film, there are parents who, you know, were blindsided by what happened to their perfect son. Uh, And when he died by suicide, they turned their grief into action and worked to try to get legislation passed that would force medical schools in Missouri to reveal their uh, or survey for depression and anxiety. And at first, all the medical schools killed the legislation. And then they tried again. And finally, you, know, you see in the film, after much effort, uh, with the help of a very brave state representative who's also a physician, uh, they finally were able to get it passed. Uh, but no, it's uh, transparency is uh, not not at the top of the list for medical schools and hospitals, quite frankly. That's interesting that you that you said that they start that we that physicians or rather medical students start out with with mental health that is either consistent with the national average, let's call it, or even better than the national average. But I would think yeah. that dying by suicide would be, there would be a higher incident among high achievers. So how do you, I don't know how to juxtapose those two ideas, right? Right. You would think so, but their emotional state, and they are perfectionists. Yes, there there may be some emotional aspect of you know, them being perfectionist, OCD, or whatever. But this is a a generality. This is a survey of them being above normal. So that's what we know. But there are ways to mitigate those rates. And at St. Louis University in the film, they did a pilot program and were able to reduce depression and anxiety by like 20%. So it was down to 4%. And it wasn't that difficult to do. It didn't cost that much. But the most important thing is these young med students, this is the foundation for their career as physicians. So the whole premise of the film is that, you know, if you don't have a, a doctor who's mentally and physically functioning well, you can't provide good quality care. So this is something that affects, you know, all of us. What was it that St. Louis University did? What what, what were the changes? Uh, it, it was a combination of small things. So, for example, they went to pass-fail, which, uh, you know, the step one. And, I would say that's uh, a big deal. I don't, I don't think that's huge. a small step. That's a big step. Now they're all doing it. But at that point, there were only like 20 schools that did it. They provided, uh, they got rid of classes that were too difficult. (laughs) And they gave their students time off. They extended a holiday like Thanksgiving for the students to go home. And they they provided them an opportunity to do charitable work in the community. So 
So they felt fulfilled, not just, you know, with their heads in the book. And they also did, you know, a, a small resiliency program. But it was the combination of these things. And of course, you know, anonymous counseling, a combination of all these things that really work. So you have a lot of hospitals now that are doing what I call these band-aid approaches to improving wellness among physicians, going online and do this models on the AMA website. Yeah, the the irony of having to do medical, having to do additional model modules, additional <laughs> work. work. I've heard. Yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> More work. It's incredible. And so what and does it do a lot of it's physicians? mindless clicking. Yeah. Mindless. And what does it do? If you don't complete it, it makes you feel worse. Well, wow, I can't even do these modules, you know, for resiliency and burnout. So that's not the solution. The solution is looking at systemic changes that should be made to allow physicians to perform at their best, whether that means providing more support people, whether it means, you know, dealing with the EMR system that, you know, nobody seems to like, uh, time off, uh, you know, dealing with the sleep deprivation, whether it's uh, dealing with the stigma of mental health, providing anonymous counseling. There's so many systemic things that should be done, but not these meditation and yoga classes. And, and certainly when you have bad outcomes with a patient, you know, they should be providing regular support, like support groups every two weeks for physicians. And you, could, you should drop in. And if you've had a bad outcome, lost a patient, you drop in. And it, it should just be part of the program, not like, oh, well, next Wednesday at 2.30 in the um, chapel, if, if you want to talk, we'll have a psychologist there for you. That's basically what's happening in many programs. It's like lip service to wellness programs, and it's just not good enough. And that's why we don't see the change that we should be seeing, because it's just very meager attempts to support physicians. So when when you confront the establishment, when you confront the establishment about this, mm -hmm. right? Who is the establishment? Who's who's in charge here? Like who do we who do we even go to? Well, really, you know, it's it's a hospital system. You know, if you work at a hospital, but there are, there are a lot of groups involved. So, for example, the medical board, the medical licensing board. The questions in many states, not New York, they changed it, but in in many states, the question that they ask on that licensing board exam to get relicensed or licensed in the first place about mental health needs to change. Uh, they ask you. I just filled out that did? form. It's, it's still there. Still there. What was yeah, the still What there. was the question still that there. was asked? Do you remember? I honestly, I don't remember. I don't remember exactly how it was phrased, but I definitely had to check some box about what, my mental Did it make health. you feel uncomfortable? No, but just b given that I have this podcast, I am more aware of that question than I otherwise mm -hmm. would have been. You know, like I, I as someone, you know, I, I don't have any diagnosed mental health issues. Um, so in the past, I would have just checked that off. But you know, this, this, one of the benefits of, of hosting this podcast is it's made me a little more attuned to issues like this. And so, yeah, when I had to fill it out, it, it, I, I understood why people would not come forward with their mental health issues because now they're having to check right. this box. And you know what checking that box means? Yeah. Right. There's going to be a whole lot more that comes down yeah. the road that's going to make it harder for you to get your license renewed. If you, if you check, uh, yes on that box. So I just, you know, I just, I don't remember specifically how it was phrased, but I'm definitely more attuned so to So that it. needs to change because physicians, you know, have the right and should be encouraged to seek mental health counseling. They're, they're on the front lines. And we see that now more than ever, people are finally starting to see how important physicians are. You know, there's been so much angst and anger towards physicians, you know, between the patient and physician relationship has deteriorated so much. 
but and everyone <laughs> right now who's on the front lines dealing with the yeah. coronavirus, right? The the ICU doctors, the hospitalists, the palliative care physicians, the ER doctors, the anesthesiologists, the pulmonary physicians, that all of these doctors that are like neck mm-hmm. deep in coronavirus right now are should should all have easy access to counseling because of what they're going Finally, through. Finally they're now. getting the it's respect really, it's going it to is. be really and hard. It, they they now are getting the respect that they have have deserved all along. But I really fear that when this is done or when this is passed, that they, those on the front lines, are not going to have access to mental health counseling. I mean, th- this is like a war. And they will be suffering from yeah. PTSD. Many of them already have PTSD from losing patients. But you know what? I fear that it's just going to be business as usual. And no mind is going to be paid to what they've gone through emotionally. And it's it's yeah. going to be a big problem. And I just fear, you know, look, suicide is, you know, what the end result gets a lot of attention. But there are just a lot of people, a lot of physicians suffering deeply with depression and anxiety. And there's a lot, as you know, of self-medicating. And, uh, you know, I come from a family of physicians, but as a patient, you know, I want my doctor to feel great and be at the top of his or her game. So we need, as a, as a society, to wake up and understand that physicians are human and that they deserve emotional support because they're human. Just like firefighters and police officers, they're on the front lines. They, they, are, they have a sense of camaraderie that physicians don't have. It's not encouraged for them to get together. They fight fires together. We treat patients by exactly. ourselves. Exactly. So yeah, I have a big fear about what's going to happen after this is over. So yeah, uh, we're we're going to talk yeah, about that it. Never, that the never occurred to me. The panel discussion that we're going to have after the the virtual screening on April nineteenth. I know that. A, so let's yeah. plug the let's <laughs> plug the virtual screening right now. Well, well it'll be in the okay. show notes, but let's pro- plug the virtual screening. Well, oh. here's how this happened because. We were planning, we've been on a film tour for almost two years, since September 2018, and we've had about 170 screenings at hospitals, medical schools, medical conferences like ASAP and uh, APA and many, many others. So we had a whole spring of, you know, live events at hospitals and conferences. And of course, with COVID-19, everything was just canceled. But I people really wanted to see this film, so I said, "Well, let's have a virtual screening with a panel discussion." And so the film is heavy. Look, it's about suicide and burnout, and it's like, why do we need, you know, to, to talk about this? We're already, you know, barely surviving here. But the panel discussion is really going to focus on how this pandemic has impacted not only the healthcare worker, not only the physician, but their families too, what they're going through emotionally and what needs to happen. So we're advocating for, let's not forget when this is over, we need court for physicians. It shouldn't be business as usual. So that's what I hope the focus of the panel discussion will be. First of all, what trends we're seeing with Dr. Pamela Weibel, uh, who, you know, is a physician advocate. She runs a hotline for physicians and medical students. Uh, Dr. Paul Pori, who's a psychiatrist at UCLA, and he's also a writer on the Chicago Med series. And uh, parents who are featured in the film uh, who lost their son, Kevin, to suicide. So we're, we're going to talk about what kind of numbers and calls that Pamela is getting on her hotline. And Paul Pori, who's a psychiatrist, will talk about the impact on physicians, families, and how they can cope best. I mean, there's 
a lot going on with separation of families because the physicians don't want to infect their families. So you've seen the stories they're sleeping in tents and in basements or, or not even at home or they're sending their families away. So they're coming home to empty homes. It's just, you know, it's a very scary time. So we, we need to, you know, deal with the fallout afterwards. Yeah, and I think it's it's important for the physicians that are going through it to realize that I'm sure as they're going through it, recognizing that they're they're not the only ones that are feeling yeah. this way, right? They're not the only ones that are having these right. thoughts. You know, we we are we are a community and we're a tribe as physicians. That's that's really the message of the film. You know, you are not alone. Yeah. You're not weak because you're feeling depressed or anxious or afraid. Even you know before this crisis. Uh, you're not alone. You're you're not a weak link, as the profession would like you to think, because you know there's cutthroat competition starting in medical school. So the 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 message of the film is, you are a community, and we have to support each other. And it's not you; it's the system, and we need to change that. When you show this movie to physician audiences. What tends to surprise us? Because I think we we understand, right, that we're under a lot of pressure, right? We have to see a ton of patients. We have to chart correctly. Every patient could be a landmine of a mm-hmm. possible, you know, an error that you could make, or you do everything perfectly, and yet they still come back and sue you. And then you're staying late to finish your charts, financial pressures to pay back your loans. You know, you get home and then your your family mm-hmm. needs you and you, you feel like you've given everything at the office right i feel like physicians we we understand this i'm not saying that i mean don't misconstrue what i'm saying like as as that, that like validating um the act but like just the the crushing pressure that we're under i think you'd be You'd be. It would be hard to find a physician that wouldn't understand that that feeling of being under this crushing pressure. At least at some point in the career, maybe just in residency, maybe afterwards. But what do you find surprises physician surprises the physician audiences when you show this to them? What 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 really well surprises us? Well, first of all, you know, physicians are born overachievers. And then, of course, you're told, you know, now you need to build resilience, so which is kind of crazy. But I'll tell you, when, when physicians see the film, because the majority of the audience is made up of, of physicians, they're shocked at how repressed they are about the experiences they had in medical school in residency, because they're just, you know, trying to keep, uh, keep on that treadmill and you, you don't want to look back because you're going to fall. So when they see the film and they see the hazing, the pimping, the bullying, um, the, you know, sleep deprivation in residency that we follow, they, afterwards they say, wow, I had repressed so much of what happened to me. And I think being able to recognize that even though it's, difficult uh it is healing it's part of the healing process because repression is not good so uh it's it's really good for them and it's good for them to share their weaknesses and their fears with each other they normally would never do that and i'm really surprised at how many people share their suicidal ideations their attempt stories their, you know, even you know, mistakes that they've made, their frustrations with administrators. I mean, they've been very vocal. So the dialogue that we see is really incredible uh, after the event. It's almost like the movie is a key that unlocks something that then just pours forth from us. Right, it's almost like permission to start talking about the things that we weren't, didn't feel like we were able to talk about before. That's exactly what it feels like. 
And my uncle uh, was a colorectal surgeon in New Jersey for 30 years. And I say was because we lost him a couple of years ago. But I showed him 20 minutes of the film when I was working on it. And he said, this is going to open up (laughs) Pandora's box (laughs) because... Physicians are just not used to talking to each other about their struggles. It's just not done. You know, in fact, like people would describe to me, you know, they would avoid each other in the hallways other than like a little nod because, you know, you don't want to ask how someone's doing because, you know, they don't want to show their weakness. And then you don't want to get involved because then you might wind up holding their pager if they need help somewhere down the line. So um, there's such little discussion about what's really going on. So you have these relationships, but they're very superficial. And what the film has done is really got people talking on a much deeper level. And some administrators are supportive of this because they understand that to improve morale, to improve wellness, you need dialogue. And you need support. So you can't just have the film and say, okay, you have the film and, you know, you got to air your feelings. Now let's get back to work. You really need to take this and move the ball forward. What can we really do? How can we be proactive to make changes that will will see real results in morale? And at the events, I talk about, you know, because I've traveled to a lot of events, I talk about solutions that I've learned along the way at different hospital systems. And I share them with other physicians and maybe it could work at your hospital or your medical school. So it's been interesting to see that sharing going on. Could we do this? Can we implement this? Uh, and so it's um, that's the way I reason why I do documentary films, it's for change. And I hope that change is happening, but I just hope that it's embraced more by the powers that be, the administrators at, at hospitals. Medical societies have been very supportive, but the AMA is not supportive of the film. The ACGME, well, they don't come off looking that well in the film, uh, not supportive. So you know, it's too bad we can't all work together, but we'll push forward for what really counts, which is systemic change to improve the wellness of physicians and also quality of care of patients. Is this an issue in other countries? Is this, or is this a product of um, an American culture where your worth really hinges on your status, whether status is defined as academic excellence or financial success? Is that, is this is this a purely American phenomenon or is this happening in other countries? That's what's fascinating. In the film, we have a section on what's happening internationally. And what we found out is that this is truly a pandemic because what we realized is that it doesn't matter whether you have a managed care system, the pay system doesn't matter. If it's socialized medicine, what it really comes down to is sleep deprivation, and the stigma of mental health, the inability of physicians to get mental health, the stigma that they face in their communities for needing counseling. So if you have those two elements, the stigma of being depressed and needing help or just wanting mental health treatment or just appearing weak, you have the stigma and sleep deprivation together, you have this problem. And we hear from people all over the world, huge problem in Asia. We hear from Australia, big problem, South Africa. Now in India, but it's it's hidden, except in India, in the film, you see they, they read the suicide notes on the evening news. So they talk about it, but it's a huge problem. So Still a problem, even though it's out in the open. Yeah, exactly. Because the stigma still exists and the sleep deprivation still exists. So especially for residents, you know, in the film, 
Dr. Charles Seisler from Harvard, he and Dr. Chris Landrigan, um, both from uh, Brigham and Women's and Harvard, who run the Sleep Center at Harvard, and they, you know, they said to me, and, and I put it in the film, like, think about it. You're a resident, a new resident. You're an intern. You just get out of medical school. You've just had all this training. And now you're about to see patients on your own. You know, you have clinicals, your third and fourth year of medical school, but I'm talking about really caring for patients on your own as an intern. And that they're really, you're set up to fail because you're forced to work 28-hour shifts when it's been proven that after 16 hours, you're not really learning. Your brain, because you are human, it doesn't have the capacity after 16 hours. And they've done many studies in the lab about sleep deprivation and medical errors. So you're a resident and you're now forced to work these slave shifts. You get into your car, get into a car accident, sent out by the hospital, go home, but come back in a few hours. And then you, you live with the fear of hurting someone or worse, killing a patient in the beginning of your career. So you're set up to fail right from the beginning that, that you, you might hurt or kill someone. I mean, this, what kind of a profession is this? So, Well, that really begs the question, what is a resident, mm-hmm. right? What is an intern? Are they a student? Right. Are they an apprentice? Are they an indentured servant? Like, what? What are? The, what is their role? Is their role just to learn? Are we trying to optimize their learning, or are they there to work? Like, you know, like a physician extender. Well, uh, I, and I think if we were really to sit down and define, we'd have to define it first before we could decide what they are, right? Uh, and then you could decide whether those work hours are are. Because they're, you know, clearly they're unreasonable, but are we going to be, are we going to accept it? Are we going to accept it because they're an apprentice? They're not a student anymore. They're an apprentice. So I think we need to define that. I mean, personally, I think the whole, the system needs to be built from the ground up because we know so much more about effective learning and effective teaching than we did. And this, this system, this system has evolved. And just like we covered in episodes on the podcast about evolution with Nathan Lentz, who's an evolutionary biologist, you know, evolution creates just, it cobbles things together, one thing on top of another. So something that used to be an arm now becomes a wing because that was the limb that happened to be there. Was it, Mm -hmm. you know, if you built it from the ground up, would you have that arm turn into a wing? Probably not. You'd probably have a separate set of wings and arms, but that's not how it works. And that's how the medical system has evolved, right? It's Mm -hmm. just cobbled together over time. It hasn't been built from the ground up. And if we could build it from the ground up, then I think we'd we'd have an effective system because of how much research is out there. So if we're really scientists, then we really do need to take what what data is out there about the most effective learning and then institute that. You're but talking about a one nobody's, nobody's asking me. No one asked you. <laughs> and you're talking about a century old system that no one wants to bother changing. And what you see yeah. is that's in, in medical school. And even in hospitals, Dr. Seisler said to me, imagine that you're using medicine has changed so much, just even in the last 10 to 20 years. But yet we're using the same models as we did years ago, decades ago. It doesn't work. So you can't use the same system. You have to evolve. But the system has not evolved in medical training, and it hasn't evolved for practicing physicians. It's a big problem because evolution could cost money and it could take time. And it seems that the people in charge, the administrators, don't want to spend the time and the money to evolve with what's happening in our society and the demands on healthcare. So, for example, well, um, because you're going to take a financial hit, right? You're going to see fewer pa- It's going to end up with either residents or yes. attendings or both seeing fewer patients, and that's going to be a financial hit. Ultimately, it may lend and to fewer medical errors and fewer right. lawsuits, but you got that front end investment that you got to make, and that's a that's a tough thing to do. We got away from something uh, that I want to come back to because I'm just really curious about what the answer is. 
you know, you mentioned that women attempt suicide more often, men die by suicide more because those their attempts are more, right, for lack of a better word, successful. But aside from the male-female split, what are the other demographics? Is this is this more common in minorities? This is more common in people from a higher or a lower socioeconomic status. Is this like who who is this affecting the most? I'm curious. The, about. the statistics are so poor because until recently, I think since 2014, when in New York, I don't know if you remember, these two young doctors within a week of each other jumped from the roofs of their hospitals. And it really woke everybody up once again, because I guess we went to sleep for a while, to to the problem of suicide and burnout. And, you know, there was a like renewed interest. Because remember, they used to have topics on mental health and about suicide and depression. Nobody would go. So it wasn't just, the, you know, the leaders of the at conferences of these big organizations. Physicians themselves didn't want to talk about this because they were, you know, brought up to, to say, this is not a problem for me because I'm supposed to be perfect. Yeah. The statistics are very shaky for me. I mean, there, there isn't, there aren't statistics that say, you know, minorities are more affected. It's, it's not. It's not a minority thing. It's not a socioeconomic uh, crisis. We don't really know. And I don't really, because we don't know, because so many suicides are really coded as accidents, we don't really have a good grasp. We, we've been using this 300 to 400 number for so long uh, because we don't really know. I do know that Dr. Pamela Weibel, when I started working on the film and she showed me this book, she said she had a, di- a suicide diary and she was compiling for herself because there were no real statistics, suicides, male, female, how, method of suicide. And when I shot that scene with her that you see in the film, she had about 200 names. Now she's got over 1,600 names in this diary. So I shot that scene with her in 2015, let's say. So that's what she's added to her diary in just that space of time. And those are just the ones that she knows about. Those aren't the ones that are coded as accidents. She can verify those. So we, so we don't really know, Brad. It's just so, yeah. that's part of the frustration that there's not a real interest to find the numbers, the real numbers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, that I was going to make the segue into the, the current pandemic. Same issue. The numbers. How many yeah. cases are out there? We don't know. You know, we're not tracking it. We're not, we're not, our testing is so limited that the numbers that they're putting out there are, you know, pale in comparison to the, to the real numbers. Um, and it's hard to code, you know, uh, who actually dies as a consequence of COVID-19 versus, you know, some secondary cause. And then, you know, those statistics are just, are just challenging. Yeah. So in, in the face of this pandemic, let's say you, you were in the process of creating your documentary, mm. right? You had done it a couple of years later so that this was occurring in the midst of you creating your documentary. What would you have done differently in the wake of the current pandemic? What would you have either included or tracked or covered if you had included this, what we're going through right now in your documentary? Well, first of all, Brad, I think it would have been easier because when I started working on this film in 2014, no one wanted to talk about it. It was so challenging to get physicians and medical students or part of the establishment to talk about this topic, it was still very much hidden. And, uh, you know, people just have this vision that physicians had this cushy life and, you know, they were playing golf. It just, there wasn't a lot of motivation to talk about it. So I, I think now, if it had happened now, there would be a lot more uh, interest to talk about the pressures and a lot more acknowledgement, a lot more transparency, because we see it. We see them getting suited up and 
getting sick and losing their lives to help patients. So, of course, this would be a fascinating example of how important physicians are. But when I started working on the film, physician suicide, hey, look, you know, suicide is a problem in society in general. Why should we care about physician suicide? And I, you know, was trying to throw out a link. Look, if, if physicians are taking their lives, what kind of care do you think you're going to get as a patient? Think about it. Think about it. So now it's, it's easier to see how important physicians are. Now, you know, they don't realize that these are ER and ICU. You know, these are hospitalists that are really on the front lines. Physicians like you that have private practices are hurting in other ways, you know, financially. You know, no one's having elective surgeries. People are reluctant to go out of their house, forget about, let alone go to an, an ENT appointment to get their deviated septum. Your yeah. wax clean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> deviated septum. Yeah. <laughs> Physicians in private practice are, are hurting in other ways, but it just would have made, made it easier to get a little empathy for physicians than, than what I experienced back in 2014, 15, 16. Well, it took me four years between shooting for a year and a half two years and then editing for another 18 months. So in, in that space of time, you know, there was just starting to see, you know, more dialogue and more programs, but uh, there was still a lot of resistance to talk about this. So it, it would have been actually easier. <laughs> Yeah, I can see that. Right now, they're mm-hmm. just so overburdened and overtaxed. And if they were already even a bit burned out beforehand, um, you know, they they have no guard left. So you ask them a question and mm-hmm. they will be more than happy to go into great detail about what is what challenges they're facing or and have been facing. I'm, I'm hoping post COVID-19, we can still use this film as a, as a means to get the community together and have a dialogue about what has happened. You know, how can we use this spotlight, this national spotlight, this global spotlight on physicians and all healthcare workers to demand change to improve wellness and safety. So tell us one more time about the virtual screening for Do No Harm. The screening is on April 19th, which is a Sunday evening. It's 8 p.m. on the East Coast, 7 p.m. Central, and 5 p.m. on the East Coast. The easiest way to register is if they go to the Do No Harm film website. And on the homepage, there's a button right there to click to learn more about the panel and the event, and then you can register. And that's donoharmfilm.com? Correct. Okay. Robin Simon, thank you so much for creating this extremely important documentary and for taking this time to do the podcast. Thank you, Brad. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.